I've been investigating the question that a viewer asked about why the uh, 12AX7 tests so poorly on the BNK650, and I answered the question to a large extent in a previous video about testing newer tubes on the 650. But I thought I might investigate it a little bit more and see if I can figure out what you would have to change in the 650 so that you could get a decent reading uh, on a 12AX7. What I have set up here are two uh, meters connected to the grids of the socket that would hold the 12AX7. And you notice that in the socket there's nothing at the present time, so it's open circuit. In a minute I'll put the tube in. But the main reason that I wanted to uh, show this is to show that the bias levels are slightly different. Now some of that could be calibration errors in the meters, but basically they show that the bias level on the 12AX7 is 2.9 volts approximately, which in the uh, in the 650 is called low bias. So let me insert the tube now and uh, see what we get. Okay, and essentially the same, uh, 2.90 uh, and 2.894 for the two grids. And let's look over here now at the meter, and you may recall that one of the reasons that the viewer had asked about this issue is a 12AX7 reads way down here in the replace range on the meter. And in the tube uh, selector for the the 650, BNK uh, says that if it reached 1200, which this is a thousand, so that's right at 1200. If it reached 1200, the tube is good. And I know this is a good 12AX7. Let's do the other test, that is test two. That's the other triode. And you see it also tests good. And finally, we'll go back up here and look at the, uh, the voltages which, as you see, have not changed uh, at all, or uh, maybe a, a, a millivolt or two. So this was done essentially to establish a baseline. That is, to determine exactly how B and K tests this tube. And what I did is I actually uh, checked the circuitry and ohmed out the connections on the 12AX7 uh, socket, which is socket 50. So uh, now let's look at what we might be able to do to, uh, to make things a little better. One of the first things that I considered was, since I have several BNK tube testers, including uh, a much later model than the 650, uh, called the 707, to go ahead and see whether BNK did anything about this issue in the 707. And there was a model in between the 650 and the 707 called the 700, which I could also check, but the 700 and the 707 are so close and I, they're identical in uh, uh, construction. The basic difference is the 700 came in a black case and the 707 in this blue and so it's mostly a marketing difference not much of a, of a technical difference so anyway here is a 12ax7 on the uh, 707 <clears throat> and we're going to do test one and you notice that it reads well it looks like it's going to be hard to read let me see if i turn the light off if it might be yeah i think that'll work better uh, you notice that it comes up to about 2,000. Let me zoom in a little better on that. And so here is test one. See, it comes up to about 2,000. And test two, also 2,000. And it indicates in the, uh, in the tube information under the 12AX7, which is right here. 
that tests good if it reads 22 or more. Well, this one just barely reads 20, but I, like I say, I know this is a good 12AX7, and so there, there may be some slight differences in the calibration of these two units, but basically it, it shows that it is that it will test good. But once again, nowhere near in the good range. So the, the first conclusion, B and K never did fix this issue with the two uh, testers, including I haven't used this check the 700 yet, but I'm, since I know it's virtually identical to the 707, I'm sure I'll get the same results there. But at any rate, 10 years later, they still hadn't fixed this problem with the 12AX7 on their tube testers. So then the next question is, where, what else could you try? If you saw my previous video on testing newer tubes on the 650, you already know this. The, uh, the 650 tests the 12A, this is a 12A T7 characteristic, at minus 3 volts of bias. So that's this line here. Well, if you look at uh, a plate voltage of, say, I think I used 300 volts in the other one, uh, in the other video, you see that your plate uh, milliamps for minus 3 is around 15 uh, milliamps at that level. At 200 volts, you will get somewhere up about 12 or 13. And at 150, with a good bias of 3, you'll essentially be cut off. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I said earlier that at 200, you'll get uh, 12. At 200 volts, you'll, with a minus 3 bias, you'll get about 5 milliamps of plate current. Now that's the 12A T7, which tests correctly. If you look at the 12A X7, and as I also pointed out in the previous video, you have to actually use the, the plate chart from the 6A V6, because a 12A X7 is basically the two high mu triode sections, each of which is like the high mu triode of a 6A V6. So they save some space by referring you to the 6AV6. But at any rate, this is the plate characteristics of the 12AX7. And you notice here that if you use a grid bias of minus 3 volts, even at 300 volts, you get just a little over a half a milliampere. This is 1 milliampere, not 10, as in the previous chart. So one thing you could do is you could uh, try do, using a different bias value. Instead of minus 3, suppose you used a bias of, say, minus 1 volt. Well, then at 150 volts with minus 1 volt, you would get a little over 1 milliampere of current. Or you might even go down to a half a volt, in which case you could get as much as 2 milliampere of plate current. And, of course, uh, plate current and mutual conductance. Mutual conductance is basically the space between one of these lines and another one. So, for example, if you have a, the bias set at this level and you apply an input signal, that input signal, let's say, was a half a volt with a, mi with a minus one volt of bias. If, suppose you used a half a volt peak, so that would take you from minus one to to uh, minus 0.5, and then in the other direction up to plus or, or minus 1.5. So this would be the swing, and then of course the uh, uh, the change in the plate current would be from this point to this point, approximately. And it's the ratio of, remember this is a conductance, not a resistance, so it's the inverse of resistance. Uh, instead of I over R or uh, E over I, it's I over E, so you take the I, which is the plate milliampere's, and divide by the change in uh, grid voltage. So you can get a higher GM up here than you're going to get down here but part of the problem is simply the low plate milliampere's.
uh, a 12 ax 7 just doesn't conduct nearly as much current. So I thought that's one of the reasons I started out this video by measuring the actual grid bias to see if maybe there was something that we could change. So then it occurred to me that well maybe I can use the 610 test panel to do some experiments. And that's where I went next. And here's how I set it up. You'll notice that I've labeled each of the switches. And those switches are, of course, the uh, switches that are up here on the 610 test panel, A through G, and then there's a bias control F. There's the Q. And then I looked at the pinout of the 12AX7 and decided to use the following connections. Of course, the filament has to connect between 4 and 5, the heater that is. Then I used the G control for cathode 2 and the F control for cathode 1. Those are basically just grounds. So this cathode is grounded and this cathode is grounded. I then used D to select pin 7 for the grid and B to select pin 6 for the plate. Now B, you may recall, is the switch that is connected to this selector, J. And so I have set the selector to the GM position. So here you see A and E connected to 4 and 5 respectively. That's the heater. Then B is set to 6. F is set to 7. The uh, G is set to 3. Remember, these are the two cathodes. And I have the C control set to neutral, to off, and the G control, I'm sorry, the D control set to 7. I'm going to put it in test 1 position, and then I'm going to slowly advance the sensitivity control. And you see, when I get to a sensitivity of 100, I get a bare good reading on the meter. Now, that bias setting, I'm now going to lower the bias, that is, the closer to zero volts, and you notice the level falls. I'm then going to raise the bias. You notice that it goes up for a while and then I keep raising it and it goes down. And when I have set it to approximately the value of the low bias, which is about 15, in other words, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that when I adjust this control to a value of 15, the bias on this tube is about minus 3 volts. Uh, and, which is approximately the low bias value, and you may notice that the reading is almost identical with what I got up on the other panel using the B and K settings. Let's now change the bias. As I lower the bias, I reach a maximum. But you notice it's still in the replace range and the reason is that the sensitivity control is still set to the value specified by B and K. Now if we turn the sensitivity up all the way to 100, you see that is the only configuration in which a 12AX7 
tests in the good region. And if you adjust the bias a little bit, you can get a maximum that's just barely in the good range. So what, what I've shown is that BNK could have set up a tester using the right bias value. A bias value very near zero volts. I'm going to guess it's probably significantly less than half a volt. But rather than rewire their bias circuitry to provide that extra bias level, they chose to simply put the note in the tube selector. So it's conceivable, it is possible, that BNK could have fixed this problem both in the original 650 and in the 707 and I assume the 700 as well by simply adding a fourth bias value or by putting a bias control like F right there into their circuitry. So instead of having a bunch of fixed bias levels, one of the things in addition to the sensitivity you would set would be the bias level. Now, I suspect the reason they didn't want to do this is one of the selling points of the, this whole series of testers was ease of use. And so I suspect that they didn't even really care for the idea of adding a 610 panel because setting up a 610 panel is basically the same as setting up, for example, uh, a, a Hickok of the day. The Hickok competitive with this was the Model 600. And basically, a uh, Hickok, you had to set up a series of controls like this. Uh, and I suspect the reason they didn't want to do that and the reason they didn't want to add a bias control is it took away from the sales pitch that all you had to do was plug in the tube, set the, the uh, heater and sensitivity controls, turn it on, wait for the tube to heat up. If you didn't see any shorts, you went to test one and test two, and you were done. For TV servicemen of the day, time in the home was what they were selling. So the quicker they could test their tubes, get the bad tubes out of the set and new tubes in, the quicker they could get on to the next call. And actually, most servicemen of the day made their money on the number of calls per day, not on the length of time of one call. And the reason is that if you think about it, nobody is really willing to pay a lot of money for a serviceman to sit in their home manipulating a piece of test equipment because they don't understand what's going on anyway. That is the customer, maybe, maybe the serviceman too. But at any rate, this was marketed for uh, service people to speed up their time in the home and I suspect that is more the reason rather than technical issues that caused them not to put a bias control and certainly not to put all of this, the 610 controls in until quite late in the process. In fact, the 610 panel didn't come out until the 650 had been out for many years. And only then because the prospect of having to rewire sockets each time a new tube came out was more than servicemen were willing to put up with. So they finally compromised and basically put a panel in that converts a 650 to a Hickok Model 600. So in compulsive completeness, I got out my Hickok 600A and set it up for a 12AX7. Now, uh, I point out that you'll notice that except for the fact that these use chicken head knobs and the others use the, uh, the round uh, knobs, basically it's the same. That is, you have to set two switches to the filament. You have to set uh, a, uh, connect a grid. You have to connect a plate. If it has a screen grid, you have to connect it. And then you have to connect the cathode. 
and also uh, a suppressor grid if necessary. Then you go through a sequence of, of tests to make sure that the tube isn't shorted and finally you put it in the tube test position. Now, one significant difference in the uh, 600, it can originally contained both a bias and a sensitivity control. Now they call the sensitivity control English. I don't know why that. Maybe they played pool and change in the direction of the ball was you applied English. I, I don't really have any idea, but the only other place I've ever seen English applied to a, a other than the language is in pool. So I'm guessing maybe the designer was a pool player. But the bias is adjustable. So I've set the bias and the English, which I prefer to call sensitivity, to the correct uh, values. And now we'll see how the tube tests. Now I've already checked it for shorts and we push the GM button. And you notice that this tests very good on this tester. And this, by the way, is my best calibrated tester. Uh, I haven't checked it in a while, but when I last put it away, it was within about 2%. I'll show you what happens to the sensitivity as you vary it. You see, you can, you can turn the sensitivity down and get a replace reading. Now, some of the dishonest servicemen of the day would actually do this. That is, they would turn the sensitivity on their tester way down and then they would show the customer that this was a bad tube, sell them the, a new tube, turn the sensitivity back to the correct position and prove to them that they had a brand new tube. This is one of the reasons that the service industry got such a bad reputation back in the 60s. But at any rate, that's the way you test a 12AX7 on the 600A. And as you see, there's none of this reads 1200 and that kind of thing. So one of the reasons uh, that I suspect that BNK eventually added a panel which allowed you to use the, the same setup, and by the way, the circuitry inside, with one small difference, are, is essentially the same as the Hickok. That is, it uses the Hickok uh, mutual conductance circuitry in the 650. They also use that in the 700 and the 707. So, with the 610 test panel, your BNK 650 is the equivalent of a Hickok 600. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this and you will look forward to maybe a few more along these same lines.